Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now, the GTX 590. It combines two GF110 GPUs, cost 699 US dollars at launch, and in 2011 it was the fastest graphics card you could buy. Not only were you buying performance, but you were purchasing bragging rights. As long as you weren't bragging to anyone who owned a Radeon HD 6990, because well, between this and that, it was a pretty close fight. So owning this was like owning two GTX 580s on a single board, except the GPUs were slightly cut down speed-wise to help keep thermals in check under this rather tame-looking shroud. It was never as fast as two 580s, that's Mars 2 territory, but for a tad under $700 instead of $1,000, well, that wasn't a terrible compromise. These days, you should forget all about it. I mean, I love it for what it was, but what it is, what it currently is, is obsolete. Driver support ended for this card in March of 2018, and SLI support is next to non-existent in most modern games, but have we ever worried about little details like that here on this channel? The Core 2 Duo CPU range is considered obsolete as well, and it has been for years, but it was only two weeks ago that I was gaming on one at 4K resolution. You may remember that when I tested the GTX 690 last year, I used NVIDIA Profile Inspector to make a few changes. Changes that ironed out a lot of flaws with multi-GPU performance. Trying that again today and I wasn't so lucky with any tweaks I made going largely unnoticed by this old Fermi beast. Time has moved on without this card, Windows has seen various updates since 2018, and so have Nvidia's driver packages, but the GTX 590 has remained untouched, it's like a time capsule in a way. Games like Fallout 4 and Far Cry 5 ran terribly with multi-GPU enabled. Okay, maybe not terribly, but not as well as when I disabled one of the GPUs. It's like SLI is working backwards here. Disable one of the GPUs and you get a better frame rate. So it was at this point I decided to follow some of my often dished out advice and that was to reinstall the graphical drivers. Now some people, when I give them this advice, they say, are you sure? I can't really see it making that much of a difference. But to be honest, a graphics card is only as good as the drivers that are provided for it. Without drivers, it's simply a lump of plastic and circuitry. So, you know, drivers are very important. And if you don't get the drivers right, well, your graphics card could be next to useless. So with the 590 I reinstalled the drivers and then decided to go all out in terms of graphical settings. With Fallout 4 I switched everything to Ultra after reinstalling the drivers and restarting the system. Now this actually improved things greatly, Fallout 4 with the Ultra settings suddenly ran very nicely and it was here that we saw the difference between the multi-GPU setting being enabled and disabled. It meant the difference between playable and unplayable. With a single GF110 GPU in this situation and Fallout 4, we were getting less than 30 FPS, yet this average was bumped up rather significantly with the second GPU enabled and the drivers freshly reinstalled. Now Far Cry 5 was a bit more difficult to run. It was a bit hit and miss. Sometimes it would start up and as we got into the loading screen, it would simply crash. So again, I persisted and eventually I managed to run the in-game benchmark test, which with the high settings gave us an average of just above 30 FPS. Now it was quite a stuttery experience, I'll admit, but with a single GPU, well, you should expect to see less than 20 FPS with these settings. So again, it could be seen as the difference between playable and unplayable if you can get the game to work. Now it's going to be different with everyone, with everyone's systems, but for me, Far Cry 5 crashed 9 out of the 10 times that I actually tried to fire it up, so I just thought I'd better mention that. Let's not forget about the obvious VRAM limitation as well, which you're going to exceed no matter the settings, and that in itself is a problem. Crisis 3 is a great example of where two GF110 GPUs really give you a great experience. Our frame rate jumped from around 60 to over 100 at the low settings here, in fact the performance was pretty much doubled. 
The once troublesome Assassin's Creed Black Flag, which has a 60 or so frame rate cap in place, fell short of that with one GPU disabled, hovering at around 45, yet enabling multi-GPU mode helped us not only to achieve but maintain a solid 60 most of the time. The thing is, owning a card like this in 2020 is going to be a very stressful mixed bag of results. I found myself googling the issues I had with games more than actually playing them, and seeing which of the many recommendations would help me out. The last thing you want to be doing when you've got the urge to game in your head is looking up why your favourite AAA titles aren't running quite right, and spending ages trying to find a solution. Having said that, you will have a much more enjoyable time with older games as we saw with Crisis, and 2008's Far Cry 2 will also give you a great result. The African Savannah still looks fantastic, and to be honest, Far Cry 2 for me is one of the best in the series, and it can be thoroughly enjoyed with a very high frame rate using the 590 in dual GPU mode. Even a single GPU will do a fantastic job here. I ran the Ranch Long Benchmark at Ultra with four times anti-aliasing. So why don't we take a look at single GPU performance? How does a single 1.5 GB GTX 580 fare these days? After all, encountering a second-hand single 580 in the wild is going to be a more common occurrence, and the prices of them have plummeted over the years. Red Dead Redemption 2 wasn't a great place to start, admittedly, because immediately we were exceeding the VRAM limitation, and jumping into story mode just ended in disaster. This is where the 3GB version of the single GTX 580 may help you out a little more, though it can be harder to find and a bit more expensive. Dirt Rally 2 at medium settings ran with 1080p resolution and barely hiccuped as we raced around the track on a time trial lap. You'll notice that we are pretty much on the cusp of the VRAM limitation throughout, and 1.5 gigs isn't really ideal in 2020, but there are some games that will not care about such a minor detail. Okay, they are obviously limited by this, but that doesn't always stop you from having a decent experience, especially in games like Dirt Rally 2 that will run on almost anything. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> Let's take a more in-depth look at the games mentioned at the start. Here is the initial Fallout 4 single GPU performance footage. As you can see, things are running a lot smoother and we're averaging close to the mid-50s at 1080p with the low settings. Though, as I described previously, turning things up to ultra will knock us down to under 30 FPS and that is where the second 580 GPU came in handy. I took a walk around Sanctuary and gone were the issues that plagued the dual 590 with the lower settings. As we took on a few rad roaches, the frame rate dipped a little, but nothing hindered my post-apocalyptic exploration too much, and if you have a single 580 and you want to play Fallout 4, then low settings will be the best way forward. If you have a GTX 590, then you can probably crank things up to high or ultra, if you don't mind a few dips. I say a few, but I mean quite a lot. Kingdom Come Deliverance ran great as well with close to 40 FPS at the low settings. Remember we are just using a single GPU now. Thankfully, it still looks great with reduced graphical options and roaming about the countryside had no adverse effects on performance. Bear in mind that as you get closer to towns or settlements, you may see a drop in the frame rate and again it's worth glancing at the VRAM figure in the top right corner. Much to my joy, The Outer Worlds also ran with at least 30 FPS. This was quite surprising, but it does tend to favour Nvidia cards, so I'm sure that helped us a little bit. In conclusion, if you want a dual GPU from Nvidia in 2020, then my first recommendation would be to ignore your temptation. If you are, however, adamant about owning one, then I'd have to suggest the 690 at the very least, as not only is this still supported driver-wise at the time of this video, but it will give you a much better multi-GPU experience and offer surprising results in some cases, as I found out when I tested it last year. I guess that's it. 
I don't want to dwell too much on a card that I can't really recommend anymore, but as I said before, the 690 will make more sense if you absolutely must own an NVIDIA-based dual GPU card, and I'd consider taking a look at the HD 6990 from AMD as well. Aside from that, you'd be better off with a top-tier single card solution from the newer Kepler range. For me, it's been good, and you've been great at keeping my house warm, but I think it's time to say goodbye. If you can find one of these cheap and you just want one to mess around with and see which games run well and which games don't, then yeah, I'd strongly recommend it if you can pay as little for it as possible. I really didn't test a huge variety of games here. This was more about pointing out some of the various issues you may encounter. But I know that you guys, if you want one, you'll probably buy one. So for a little bit of tinkering around something to play around with, yeah, it might be worth it. But to me, it just seems like too much trouble in this modern age. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to gently tap that like button. Hit that dislike button if you did not enjoy it. Why not click the big red subscribe button if you wish to do so? You don't have to if you don't want to. And hopefully, I'll see all of you in the next one.